Our second scripture this morning is one actually that we used in Buhira, and Carol will um, explain a little bit about Buhira when she gets up. It comes from Ephesians 4, verses 11 to 13. The gifts that he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. This is God's word for God's people. What we're going to do is I'm going to frame this just a little bit uh, before people come up so that you have a, a little bit of an understanding um, of what we're going to do. Bob, would you go to the, to the next slide, please? I want to remind you of the purpose of our trip was to continue to build a relationship with Africa University by partnering with Africa University staff and students in support of the work and the missions of Africa University and of the United Methodist Ministries at Old Mutari. This is a long-term project and will continue to go back every two years as long as there's a continued interest. And I, I promise you the word is already getting out. I've had two people say, when are you going again? We're going to go in October of 2017. You guys don't know that yet. That was just a decision that we made uh, just a few, minutes, a few days ago. So October 2017, um, so save you pennies. Um, would you go to the next slide, please? One of the first things we did, we learned from the very first trip, and this time we said we're going to do our training in culture a little bit better. So we spent a couple of days in Johannesburg um, learning um, about different cultures, about how to interact with this particular culture, and a little bit about apartheid um, in South Africa, in Johannesburg in particular, but it's something that's shared um, across, the, across Africa. And that made a big difference, don't you think? Um, in the way that we were able then to interact with the students who were from a very different culture than we in the West. And so what I want to do now is turn this over to the team, and we're each going to do a two-minute snippet um, of little pieces. Yeah, except for Rich, and I'm, if you see me tap somebody on the shoulder, that means they've gone over their two minutes, because <laughs> we want to make sure we get out in a timely fashion. That is a Western idea, by the way, come out in time. Uh, so I'm going to invite Rich to come up and uh, get us started and talk about his interaction with the Africa University students. This is Rich Straub from Orion United Methodist Church. Could you come up, Rich? Come up here, so that yep, so that we can video it. Yes, you can. Okay. Uh, my name is Rich Straub. I come from uh, Orion, Illinois. I am the uh, Illinois Great Rivers Conference Africa University Committee Chairman. Uh, I was given the invitation to join this team uh, as the lone wolf. Samuel went to the house of Jesse, and in the house of Jesse, he was told to pick the king who God wanted to choose because he was disappointed in Saul. Jesse had seven sons. Those seven sons ranked from here to here, and Saul went through every seven sons that he had in an interview, so to speak, and God rejected them all. He finally went to ask uh, Jesse, is there anyone else in the house? He says, yes, there was David. David was a shepherd out in the field. He says, I want to see him. God rejected every one of his sons because he looks at people differently than what we do. And so David came into the house and God says, this will be your king because I look at the heart. I don't see what's on the outside. I see what's on the inside. And we shared that with the students at Africa University. And we noticed the distinguishable differences between what we appeared from the outside, but we had something in common from the inside. And that was our heart. Those who follow Jesus Christ have the commonality of the heart for Christ. So when we left, that was one of the messages that we left with. That yes, we were separating physically because of what we looked like, but where we were taking with us those that remained at Africa University and those of us that returned to the United States, we were taking a commonality amongst all of us, and that was the heart. And that was the relationship that, that I think many of us shared through, uh, through Christ while we were there as ambassadors representing Jesus Christ, the commonality of the heart.
Rachel was not able to be with us, but she um, is going to talk about a university student empowerment union, and this is her video. I'm excited to share with you about the university student empowerment union. This is a student group of refugees who meet on campus for social and emotional support, as well as to share meal tickets and other basic necessities. I met with the union um, for the first time with Joe and then the second time with my mom. And we just listened to them share their stories. You could see their posture change as they shared about themselves and just let their stories be heard. A common story that was shared um, was that of being left orphaned by the rebels and witnessing the deaths of their entire family. Despite the trauma that we heard, that they had such an incredible grasp of hope in Jesus. They know that God is in control, and they explained to me that God was using my mom and me to show them that he sees them and he loves them. They were so grateful that someone had sought them out, and some even confessed that they only came because they didn't believe that someone was actually looking for refugee students. When you're given a number as your identity, um, I think it's easy to believe that you are nothing but a number or that you're invisible. And so they were amazed when they heard that someone from the United States was looking for them. And I think God was working both angles where he gave me the desire of my heart and loving refugee students. And at the same time, he used my mom and me to see them and encourage them in their suffering. I know I've been deeply humbled by the University Student Empowerment Union and I'm standing um, with them in prayer and I invite you to do the same. You can for their financial needs to be met, um, for their emotional health as the effects of PTSD surface in their lives, and um, for them to just experience the love of God in new ways. So I hope you've enjoyed hearing about the University Student Empowerment Union, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you, church. One of the great joys we had was to be pack mules for folks here, um, Indiana gathered up used clergy robes to send to the graduating students. If you haven't been online to see what it costs to get a preaching robe, um, they're very expensive. And so we toted about uh, 70 pounds of clergy robes. Um, and on a Wednesday, uh, first week we were there, had the great honor of celebrating with the graduating seminarians who were now going out for their first appointment. Um, and one of those robes was the robe that someone had purchased for me when I started, and I took that with us. And, and when we got to that robe, um, the, the head of the, of, the, of the theology, School of Theology, held it out, and you can see the picture up there, and she said, now this is for a short woman. Do we have any short women? And there was one, and she waited for a while, and one of them said, oh, I'm short, it's me, it's me. And she was so excited to be able to get a robe that was her height uh, just for her to go out to her very first appointment. Um, and they were all excited. We danced and we celebrated. We shared the cup and uh, the bread uh, in communion, um, and it was glorious. Marlene? Marlene is from St. Paul's Lutheran Church, and she joined us. I've spent 40 years in a lab, I'm now retired, but I was in a medical lab and I was very excited to see the lab at African University and on our original tour I saw some instruments and I thought, oh wow, uh, they're not quite as far behind as I found. Well, upon a later date, next day or so, I went and those instruments aren't operable because they don't know how to use them, or do they have the reagents to use them? So some company sort of dumped some instruments in the middle of that university, and um, there they lie. Um, <clears throat> the clinic itself was a safe place for students where they could go and find maybe some very different Comfort if a student of a student was stressed or whatever, they could even just go and lie for a few minutes. But it was 
a place that students could express concerns and treat minor health care issues. Um, I think the thing that I was most I think it broke my heart the most was that the lack of educa medical education and availability to medical facilities that these people had. Um, they're back in the 1920s and um, you can't, they can have a beautiful operating table and light and all their windows are open. Which would, you know, I've told that to friends and they've been horrified by it, but I think I've said enough now, so thank you. <laughs> breathe, Gary, breathe. is uh, the people hauler that we saw in 2013. And it was not operating when I got there. It is now. <laughs> the second, or the top picture with the new John Deere long disc was um, delivered on Tuesday that we were there at the university and the lower picture is the farm workers in that as well as our team and Pastor Karen and the team prayed over the new disc and I asked Larry where the disc came from and he said it was either probably Brazil or Germany the other picture up there is Rich and I were putting the rock back on the um, FIT 640 tractor that is in need of tires very much. There's a, a 640 Massey Ferguson that sets this to the right of that picture as you see it and that one also needs tires. Um, big cuts and it, there is some rocky ground over so, and they have now 145 hectares that they are farming. And not only that is the, they have the dairy, uh, the chickens, the hogs. When we were there in 2013, the chicken laying hens were 2,588. Today they are 4,000 laying 90%. Um, they also have a fishery now, a hatchery there, that um, it was a class project and they had nobody to finish it off, so it's been left over to the farm. The rabbitry is also the same thing. It was a class project, nobody to continue on with it. And they are looking to expand that. They also now have goats and sheep, which is um, another class project that the farm has taken over. Um, the horticulture department did not have anything growing at this time. Their um, greenhouses were pretty empty. There is one picture that we didn't put up there Wednesday, the first Wednesday that we were on campus, we um, went to the farm workers church service at 6.30 in the morning. They, all, they did part of the service, Pastor Karen did part. 
part of the service. And afterwards, I presented Trevor, who is the farm manager, with receipts of the $2,900 that we sent over there for student fees. And then, Larry had asked me to bring something to auction off. <laughs> the first two were great. They were pins, it was easy. The second was a cross that we took with us, or the third rather. And when this, I thought was her father, or Actually, I thought it was his father, and he, as I thought, eyeballed me from the time they came in. So when I saw that cross, I made sure that the little boy got it, only to find out it wasn't a little boy, <laughs> <laughs> but Hazel. And Hazel's mother did our laundry while we were there. Her father works in the dining hall. And after I put that little cross on Hazel, she was out to meet me every day <laughs> as I went to the farm. And those people are so appreciative of what we do. I really got to work with them with the farm crowd this year, or the workers. And Francis was the head mechanic, so it was, I was working with him. Um, and we were trying to put tractors back together as parts for each tractor, whether they were in it or in front of it, so they could sell these that are not working and they're not going to be working. It was great. They asked for um, my comments and my thoughts on different things, and um, I was very grateful for that. Thank you. Celia is a member of St. John's United Methodist Church, and she's going to share about Ishe and Nesu, which is something her heart. Moanani. Moanani. That's good morning in Shona, and I can say that because Rachel's not here to correct my pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very grateful for that. <laughs> but I'm also grateful to have had the opportunity to go to Africa with Asbury, and I appreciate all your support, and I do thank you for that, for this group. Um, I'm reporting on the uh, after school program held at this Hilltop United Methodist Church. I wasn't expecting to see anything very dramatic. I assumed that they kept them out of trouble after school and maybe helped them with their homework a little bit. I was completely wrong. <laughs> um, we went to the, the church. It is at the top. Uh, it's called Hilltop because it is at the top of the hill. And around surrounding the hillside are the shacks that the families live in. I actually have a picture of one of them that's very typical. I think Roy mentioned that it's about um, the houses look like a one-car garage that houses four families. We're told that the parents sleep on top of the bed and the children sleep underneath. So you understand the conditions under which these children are being raised. Um, the children are chosen for the after-school program because their parents cannot pay their school fees. It's about $30 a semester, three semesters a year. Farm workers at the farm made $70 a month. So you can imagine the pressure that they're under to try and come up with those school fees. One child from each family is chosen for the after-school program. The program provides school fees, medicine, two uniforms a year, tutoring. They also teach them knitting and sewing on those wonderful hand-cranked Singer sewing machines. I'm sure many of us remember using those. Um, and it is staffed by two women, one of whom is um, United Methodist assistant minister at the church, so he's on the payroll there, the second of whom believes she was called by God to work in the program and accepts no salary for her work running the program. So this is a tip to anybody in business. 
hire someone who doesn't want a paycheck and you'll have a really efficient business. And that was just one of the aspects that impressed me with this program. It was so efficient and so effective that when they finish school, the program also pays for them either to get vocational education or to go to Africa University, which is about $5,000 a year. In this way, every family involved in the program has a breadwinner. Consequently, the church has reached out to the community around them and improved the standard of living for the entire community. Lastly, we learned that the program started in 2000, so some of the children have graduated from the program, and they have returned, having benefited from the program, and are now sponsoring younger children in the program. So it is becoming self-sustaining. It's largely supported by American churches at this time, but increasingly those students will be returning to re support their own communities, which I was enormously impressed with. I came home and wrote a check, probably larger than I should have done, but I reflected that I would manage, they might not. So I would ask you to consider prayerfully donating to this program. Karen has contact information. You can donate through the United Methodist Mission Board and it will reach the program and they are enormously appreciative of our support. Thank you so much. Roy Roberts um, is a member of the Heinrich Hedrick, I'm getting closer. Hedrick United Methodist Church is close to Ottumwa. Before uh, <clears throat> I went on this journey, I read a book, <clears throat> excuse me, written by Janine Roberts. It's called uh, Care to L uh, Love Completely. Uh, she was a young theological graduate, went to Africa on a mission, went to a orphanage and found these horrific conditions that these uh, orphans were living in. I read this book and I thought to myself, I have to see this orphanage. So when I got, uh, when we got to the university, one of the first things I did is went to the uh, Fairfield's uh, children's home. And as soon as myself or anybody else in our group got off uh, out of the van, we were surrounded by 80 orphans, and I hate to call them orphans, they're just young people from the age of four months to 25 years of age. Not one of these kids ever pushed any one of us away. They grabbed us by the hand, they would share anything they had. They took us to their homes, they showed us where they slept, they showed us their clothes. Uh, they were very proud of what they were doing. Uh, one of the prized possessions of these children was a pop bottle cap that they would pla put plastic on the inside and then they would take their finger and they would make games out of anything that was possible. They were jumping around the ground playing hockey. They had a piece of wood on the top of an old grill that they would put uh, circles. They would play uh, making any kind of games up in their mind. Their, uh, imagination was just wonderful. Uh, we went to their homes, we sat with them, we read them books. Uh, if you were walking down the pathway, you would have one child in each hand by the time you got to where you were going. You had one under each arm. Uh, you were singing songs. They were happy. One day I was walking <clears throat> along the path and I looked up and there was a lady walking toward me and she was holding children and I walked up to her, excuse me, and I said, is your name Janine? And she said, yes, it is. And this was the author of that book. And I just thought to myself, what a wonderful person. Um, I think to myself, did we make a difference? Did I make a difference? Well, I'm gonna let you judge that. These are just two notes that these kids wrote to me. The first one says, Dear Pen Pal, hi. Thank you with the, thank you with the visitors. 
you have sent to play with us. We were happy to play with them. It was good days. May Jesus bless you. It was lovely to play with them. One day when I grow up, I will come there. We at Fairfield Children Home, thank you. This may seem kind of crude to you, but it, this is something you hand them a book, they write in it. You hand them a camera, they would run away with it and come back, and you'd have 600 pictures on it. <laughs> this is a letter from Abigail to Roy. I love you, Roy. <clears throat> thank, you to, thank you for coming. I miss you. I will be very happy when I see you again. I was wanting to write this letter for you so that I will remember you and you will remember me. I love you. At Fairfield, people will be sad when you go. I will be sad when you go. Your loving friend Abigail and Fairfield Children Home are saying goodbye. We love you all. And that was from Abigail. And in closing, there's one thing that struck me about the book that I read about uh, Africa that Janine wrote. She said, if you leave Zimbabwe and you don't feel a tug at your heart, don't mind coming back every day. Bob to see whether or not um, a DVD can be played. No? Okay. Uh, Fairfield Children's Home is two miles away from the African University campus. Uh, and Roy has shared a lot about um, Fairfield. Uh, last week here in service, Pastor Karen shared um, a Romans passage that talks about how we are all actually waiting for our adoption. These children and we have the commonality of being orphans and yet orphans who have been adopted by one father. And so um, we are all in the same family as uh, Pastor Karen shared with the children this morning. One of the reasons that we chose to go to Zimbabwe in April is that the students would be home on their break and we would have an opportunity to spend more time with them at home. And so we asked Fairfield, what is it that you want us to do? What is it that you want us to bring? And they immediately said, we want you to bring books. Their schooling is done in English, although in the homes they speak Shona. And they needed they need to have practice. As we know here in our schools, our children need to have a good foundation in reading. And so we took 135 pounds of books, we took two e-readers, and we took a laptop that had been donated and we, um, that were filled with books, and we read with them. But as Roy also shared, we were there to encourage them. There are two boys that um, live at Fairfield, and their names are Gift and Promise. And what a wonderful reminder in their names of what God has done. He has gifted us with adoption, and he has promised to never leave us and to always be with us. And that's what we found at Fairfield. was that we wanted to partner with the students at Africa University. Africa University also has a VIM team. That's one of the, the things that the students can sign up and do. There's 20 to 30 people on this VIM team, and we wanted to partner with them to do a, a project. They had decided that we would partner with them to go to Buhara. 
Buhara is a village that is a three-hour ride in, on a bus from Africa University. The last 30 miles was very, very rough, almost a road. Um, we picked up people along the way to take to church. We went through on a Sunday because we had purchased a chair, a desk to go to their school. They had just, they have a church and they had just finished making another room in a, in a school. There's 50 students in a classroom. We took 25 desks and each desk holds two people. So they were very pleased that now all the students didn't have to sit on the floor and get their uniforms dirty. But the neat thing was we had church with them. Um, because they rarely get visitors, four churches from the surrounding community, or three churches from the surrounding community came and there were four churches together. They introduced all the prominent people from the churches and one was a chief. Uh, it was a mere two and a half hour church service that did not seem like it was that long. And the neat part about it was they asked Pastor Karen to do the service because we only speak English she asked the other pastor if he would translate. So she'd say a few sentences, and he'd say a few sentences. And she'd say a few sentences, and every time he would just get more animated and throwing his hands around and speaking up, and the more animated he got, the more animated Pastor Karen got, and that was so neat to see. Uh, and you could tell she was really having fun doing it. Afterwards, I said to the pastor, I said, there's no way you were saying what she said because you said far more words than she did. He said, our language does not have words that says emotions. So he had to elaborate on what he was saying. He also said to us, the desks were really nice that you brought and we appreciate those. But coming to see us meant so much. People never come to our village and that people from the United States would actually take time to come see us and be with us. We were so grateful and so appreciative that you came. Jo was busy getting ready this morning. She is here, she's sitting in the back, but she um, also has a video for you on two pieces that struck her. for me was the opportunity to work with Cecilia, who was the acting director of the Children's Home. She had asked our team if there was anyone who would be able to teach her how to use an accounting software that was on her computer, but which she didn't know how to use. I spent time with her and taught her how to enter information and how, with the click of a mouse, she could create accounting reports. You can imagine how excited she was to learn that she would be able to do everything on the computer that she had been doing manually. Another highlight for me was the farewell tea given the last day we were on campus. It was hosted by the student VIM team. There were about 10 to 12 students there, nearly all of them representing a different country from Africa. At the end of the tea, we all stood in a circle and held hands and said a prayer. Each member of the VIM team said a prayer for our safe return in their native language. You can imagine how moving that was. At the end of the prayer, most of our team had tears in our eyes because it was so impressive. I want to thank you for your prayers while we travel to Africa University. Come to the time of our worship now to to give back to continue the ministries of this church which include the ministries to africa and to this community and to um, those here in our pews and so if the ushers would prepare to wait upon us to take our gifts and our offerings uh, there will be a video display of some photos and some other music uh, from africa while we're taking this
Oh, pray to the Lord.